ask you a question, and I have my laptop up here, it's just a whole lot easier uh, with me with the PowerPoint slideshow here. I don't have the slides up, but that's okay. But I want to ask you a question. I want you to answer it in your mind and in your mind only. So don't say it out loud, don't raise your hand, don't nod your head yes or nod your head no, but I want you to answer in your mind yes or no, and I'm only going to give you three seconds to think about it and answer it because I want you to do it as fast as possible. Here's the question that I want to ask and answer this evening. Does the historical accuracy of Joshua and Judges matter to your faith? One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three. You got your answer? Okay, by the end of this message, I want to ask it again and see if your answer changes. I want to challenge the answer that you have in your head. Now with that in mind, let's remember faith that is not tested cannot be trusted. So let's think about the book of Joshua and Judges this evening. I remember growing up at Boonsville Baptist Church, I can't remember who taught me, uh, who, which Sunday school teacher it was, which junior church work, worker it was, but all I know is at some point in time, I learned all the stories in the book of Joshua. I learned about how the story of Rahab in Joshua chapter 2, how Rahab came on the scene and helped the two spies and uh, helped them get away from all those who were after them. I remember learning about in Joshua chapter 3 how God providentially and sovereignly opened up the Jordan River and they walked across the dry land just like they did back in Exodus over the Red Sea. I remember learning about in Joshua number six, chapter 6 how the people of Israel marched around the walls of Jericho and the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. You remember that story? That's a fun story to tell. In the book of Joshua chapter 7, here's something that, that preachers like to preach on this all the time. They like to talk about the sin of Achan. And about the importance of not hiding sin from God and not having secret sin. I can't tell you how many times I've heard sermons about that. Brother Dave and Brother Andrews have probably preached many times in that passage. How about Joshua chapter 10? I heard about this during the time period when Brother Dave was my youth pastor. How the sun stood still. And I thought to myself, is that even possible? For the sun to just stop moving and the moon to stop and everything just freeze in time. How about Joshua chapter 14? Caleb, remember him? One of the main characters of the book. He stood on top of that mountain and he said, Give me this mountain. And then in Joshua 24, I've had the privilege of being, visiting many of you in your households and your homes. And, and I've noticed in the majority of houses I've been in for pastoral visits, that it's somewhere in the house, whether it's on a wall, whether it's in the bathroom, or whether it's on the door, there's this verse, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now let's transition and think about the book of Judges. When you think about the book of Judges, what comes to your mind? Well, obviously some gruesome scenes transpired. In fact, the first time I read the Bible, I began to actually read it as a high schooler, so about 16 years of age, and I remember reading the New Testament first, going back and reading the book of Judges, and I thought to myself, is this even in the Bible? Because you have this obese king whose name is Ehud, who's left-handed by the way, and he gets stabbed, gruesomely stabbed and killed. I, I read, read about a wife, how she took a large nail and drove it into her husband's temple and skull, into the ground and killed it. I, I read about how, I think it's in Josh, Judges chapter 19, where, or 17 or 18, when, when a lady, a group of men came upon this lady and abused her and raped her and then cut her body into pieces. Man, can that even happen? Wow, talk about the depravity of man. How about Judges chapter 4? I read about the prophetess Deborah, and I thought to myself as a 16, 17-year-old, because I grew up in a very conservative Southern Baptist church, and I said, man, are, are women even able to do that? <laughs> and in the Old Testament, God raised up Deborah in a time period when no other men were willing to do the work of God, so God used her to do that then. In Ju Judges chapter 6 and 8, we read about the story of Gideon. How Gideon had laid out his fleece before God, and, yeah. and he doubted God, and he said, God, if you want me to do this, then let water be on the ground around the fleece, and I'll do it. And, and so when he woke up the next morning, sure enough, that's what it was. And then he said, well, I, I just, uh, I'm still a little bit of doubting right now, so God, how about, how about the water be on the fleece the next morning? And so God did the same thing, and eventually God calls him, and he does some great things. And you remember about his army. They went and defeated the Midianites. With only 300 men, now the Midianites were apparently a gifted military of their time period. And the 300 men in Gideon's army didn't have all the essentials we have today with the guns and the cannons and everything. But all they had was a torch with fire and they blew their trumpets and the Midianites went totally crazy. In, Joshua, excuse me, in Judges chapter 13 through 16, we find the story of Samson. 
Samson is probably the strongest man physically that, that's ever lived. I mean, he killed lions with his bare hands. And I know many, many of us here today, we think we're strong. I'd like to see you take on a lion and a tiger. May God be with you if you try that. Then we study about how Samson had his strength. And it was from having that long hair. And finally, they discovered it through Delilah. And they cut his locks and his strength ceased. And then they gouged his eyes out. He could no longer see. And he's in the Philistine territory. And, and he prays. And he says, God, give me strength. And God gave him strength one more time. As we looked um, uh, last time on Wednesday. But scholarship has questioned the historical accuracy of these events. So in other words, here's some of the question scholarship. That is, these people who criticize the Bible, they don't believe the Bible to be true, so they come in and they try to hammer the Bible. They say, are these stories actually history? And probably in the Old Testament, outside the book of Genesis, Joshua and Judges is probably up there with high, being highly critiqued amongst the Old Testament. So they ask questions like this. Is there evidence for Israel crossing the Jordan River? When I went to Israel, I mean, in my mind, I mean, I'm thinking that, that the Jordan River is just going to be this gigantic river. I mean, pro it's probably like a mile wide. And, and, and in the scene in the Old Testament, when, when God parted the Jordan River and they walked across, I could just see that it was just a gigantic ocean that God parted. And I remember going to the Jordan River in different sections, and literally uh, some of the Olympian athletes could probably run and jump across it if they're fast enough and can jump far enough. But is there any evidence for Israel crossing the Jordan River? Is there historical support for the sun standing still? Were Joshua, Rahab, Caleb, and Achan historical characters? Were Samson, Gideon, Barak, Jephthah, Deborah, and Ehud historical characters? Is there historical support for Gideon's army of 300 men defeating the Midianites? And then one last little question here. Is there documented evidence outside of the Hebrew Bible supporting the destruction of Jericho? These are questions that have been challenged in recent scholarship when we study the Old Testament books of Joshua and Judges. I want to remind you today, my message title this evening is this, Faith that is not tested cannot be trusted. Remember the question I asked you, does the historical accuracy of Joshua and Judges matter to faith? Well, I say, no, it does not. Because if you think that history is your final authority, then yes, everything in history has to line up with the Bible. But if your final authority is the Word of God then what history says doesn't have to necessarily line up with the Word of God. You know why? Because history doesn't always speak truth. And this evening, I want to challenge you by saying these, these thoughts. Five reasons why the historical accuracy of Joshua and Judges does not matter to our faith. Reason number one, now these are a little bit lengthy due to the, the scene when I'm going to be giving this talk uh, uh, tomorrow, in fact. But, but So just bear with me. Reason number one, it does not matter to faith because we have not discovered everything about the historical context of Joshua and Judges. Reason number two, think about these things. Ponder with me. We're going to get down a little bit deeper than normal. It does not matter to faith because believing Joshua and Judges requires a simple childlike faith. Number three, it does not matter to faith because history can neither prove nor disprove the events of Joshua and Judges. Reason number four, it does not matter to faith because Joshua and Judges' historical accuracy does not negate the theological truths therein. And reason number five, it does not matter to faith because the New Testament affirms the historical content of Joshua and Judges. Remember, faith that is not tested cannot be trusted. Reason number one, let's pause and talk this through. It does not matter to faith because we have not discovered everything about the historical context of Joshua and Judges. How many of you have ever heard of Thomas Edison? You can raise your hand on this one, and I'm not going to shoot you down. Thomas Edison, would you say he was a wise man? Surely he was a wise man. He's been credited for saying, we know one millionth of one percent. That's not much. Let's assume... Each of us here this evening know 50% of everything in the world. 
Let's say, let's take it a step further, and let's say we know 50% of everything about the historical context of Joshua and Judges in the Old Testament. Do you think it is possible that in the 50% of things you do not know about the Old Testament, sp specifically pertaining to Joshua and Judges, for there to be historical accuracy and truths revealing the context of Joshua and Judges? Well, if you're reasonable, you have to answer, sure. It is possible. Do you know everything there is about history? Would you consider yourself to be a historian? Even historians don't know everything about history. And by the way, according to the Bible, only God is omniscient. I know you might think you know everything about the Bible and, and history, but you don't. God knows everything about history. And just because man at this current time period may not always line up with, with what the Word of God says doesn't mean man is right and God is wrong. It means God is right and man is wrong. All right. Now, with that in mind, I want to share this with you. Um, I already asked one of these questions, a couple of them, but, but, but listen to this. If what you believe is not true about the historical context of Joshua and Judges, are you willing to change your belief system? So right now... If, which, by the way, I do believe everything is historically accurate in the Bible. I mean, come on. I'm just trying to challenge your thinking. But let's, let's just suppose that everything here may not be true. That is, that lines up with what our belief is. So let's say somebody here this evening does not believe that everything in Joshua and Judges historically happened. And then let's say that you do believe that. Are you willing to look at the evidence from within Scripture and ask yourself, Am I willing to change my belief? Because the Bible, my friend, is the final authority, not the historian on Amen. National Geographic Amen. or the History Channel. Now, this guy named James Hoffmeyer, he's a scholar, and he's written a book called Do Historical Matters Matter to Faith? And some great little chapters in there and some articles. But he says this, Biblical theology and biblical history are intricately woven together. Forming a tightly spun tapestry. Here's how I summarize this statement. Biblical theology and biblical history do not contradict each other. They complement each other. However, historical accuracy of the biblical text is not a necessity necessarily to have faith in the theology of the biblical text. Now, you have to understand that the historical setting of Joshua and Judges hinges upon your dating method of the Exodus. So a while back, Brother Johnny asked me a question about the history of Exodus and the time frame. I guess you watch something on the History Channel. And, and so it's something that we need to be aware of. But so some people view the book of Exodus, that is people leaving, the Israelites leaving Exodus, as an early date, which I hold to, and I believe fits within the time period of the Word of God. Then there's going to be some people who hold to a late date. And those who hold to an early date typically believe the Bible is the literal word of God. And those who believe, excuse me, those who believe in an early date believe the Bible is the literal word of God. And those who believe in a later date believe that the Bible is more of a book that's full of allegorical stories. So you need to understand that. But the, however you view it, you know, we're not going to get into the issues here. But, but with that in mind, it brings over... Uh, an issue in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, where it says the 480 years, it talks about this, 480 years, from the, this particular moment to this moment. And then you have another 300 years in Judges chapter 11, verse 26, and this points to an early date of Exodus. And then in the book of Judges, as you tally up the dates of the kings, you can go do it for yourself, this 480 years, you get, when I've added it myself, and you get 593. It's a little bit off. When you take the dates and you add them up specifically. And so most scholars, conservative scholars, believe that the reason why it does this is because there was times in the Old Testament where they overlapped, these judges, the periods. And we're not going to get into all those details, but there are explanations for some of these challenges that these critical scholars have done. And I just want to share this with you. It does not matter to faith because we have not discovered everything about the historical context of Joshua and Judges. Number two, as we're moving forward, I'm going to try to go through these as fast as possible. So I want you to stay with me. I know it's a little bit deeper than normal, but, but I know that you can hang on to this because you're very brilliant. Number two, it does not matter to faith because believing Joshua and Judges requires a childlike faith. We mentioned the walls of Jericho. Let's imagine we're with Brother Dave in junior church 
and we're teaching the story of Joshua and Judges to the children. And we're like, boys and girls, in the Old Testament book of Joshua, God commanded them they were going to take the city of Jericho. And I want you to get with me in a line. I want you to march around this table with me. And so all these kids are marching around, Brother Dave and the Fellowship Hall, the table. And, and he says, God told them for six days, you're going to march around the walls of Jericho once. But on the seventh day, you're going to march around seven times, and then you're going to blow a trumpet, and then the walls are going to come down. And I can see old Noah back there saying, oh, no way, Daddy. Did that really happen? <laughs> and so that happened. And I share that to say this, that, listen, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 8, at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as a little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Check it out now. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence. You hear that? The evidence of things not seen. By the way, None of us know anything about history that is accurately because none of us were actually there. <laughs> Think about that for a little while. Think about it now. Imagine telling that story to the children and being like, now, even though this is in the Bible, it's not true. How crazy is that? I mean, seriously? All it requires is a childlike faith. I want to share this with you. Historical discoveries of the Hebrew Bible can add credibility to it. Historical discoveries of the Hebrew Bible can offer reliability to it. Historical discoveries of the Hebrew Bible can demonstrate the authenticity of it. And it can also reveal the accuracy of it. History in itself doesn't necessarily prove anything. All we need is a childlike faith. The Bible is, is a credible document that has been tested and believed to be true. The Bible is a reliable document that has consistently performed well throughout the library of time. The Bible is an authentic document that has an undisputed, genuine origin. And the Bible is an accurate document that is precisely correct. Number two, remember, it does not matter to faith because believing Joshua requires a childlike faith. I want to share with you thirdly. Say with me now. I encourage you to do it. It does not matter to faith because history can neither prove nor disprove the events of Joshua and Judges. Here's where I want to park for just a little bit. Imagine I made a declaration, a dogmatic declaration, saying there is no gold in the United States. But then, Brother... Andrew says, there is gold in the United States. Who do you think would have a harder time proving their theory? Brother Andrews, that there is gold in the United States, or me, that there is not gold in the United States? Think about it now. When Brother Andrew sets out, let's say he walks out and he goes into the seminary and reaches down and picks up a big old handful of gold. He found gold. He didn't have to search everywhere. For me to say that there is no gold in the United States, you know where I have to go? I have to go all over Virginia, search everywhere in Virginia. I have to search all over West Virginia. I have to search all over North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, New Hampshire, uh, Vermont, Pennsylvania, New York, Minnesota, uh, California, Texas, Alaska, Hawaii. I've got to go all over the United States in every valley, every mountain, underneath every tree, underneath every rock, and say, it's not here. I say that to say this, that the burden of proof concerning the historical accuracy of the Word of God is not on me as a Bible believer. It's on those who are skeptic toward the Word of God. All we have to do is discover one area in the Bible that is historically sound. And by the way, there's many of them in here. You don't have to go through and necessarily prove all of them. So here's something that I thought was interesting. Scriptures are innocent until proven guilty. However, some of these wise, uh, so-called wise scholars out there think otherwise. This one scholar, his name is Whitlam. I've been reading it. He's a secular humanist. And he says that everything from Genesis chapter 1 all the way through the Judges and Samuel is fictitious. But I'm here to tell you something. It's not a figment of our imagination. It is a divine declaration that is true. Amen. Now, I believe that when we look and analyze the Word of God, it should be considered innocent until proven guilty. 
And so I've read the book of Judges. I've studied it. I mean, I've read the book of Joshua. I've studied it. I've read all the Old Testament. I've read the New Testament. And I continue to study it more in detail because I just love doing it. And we all should do that. I'm not saying you have to do it in a similar manner that I'm doing it, but you should at least read it and spend time meditating therein. And here's a challenge for you. If you don't believe the Bible is the Word of God, feel free to show me where it's not. You can't just pick and choose parts and say this part is Scripture and this part is not. You can't just pick and choose, my dear friends. Now, here's some thoughts about archaeology. I know we like to say archaeology proves the Bible, but archaeology doesn't really prove the Bible. Archaeology doesn't necessarily prove anything about history, by the way. Archaeology does shed light upon history. It can impact our interpretation of history. It can only prove that a road, a building, a structure, or an artifact was made and used by somebody in the past. Things in archaeology do not come with a date stamped on it and said, made by King George III in 1373. <laughs> it's not how it works. You see, people find these artifacts and they look at them and they try to date things and it's all hypothesis. So, maybe the real question is, is, is it possible for our historians to know anything about history in an, in an affirmed manner? All right. It does not matter to faith because history can neither prove nor disprove the events of Joshua and Judges. Number four. I'm going through these pretty rapidly. I like this one. Because here's what is more meaningful about this issue than anything at all. It does not matter to faith because Joshua and Judges, historical accuracy, does not negate the theological truths therein. All that means is just because some guy who's called a historian says it's not historically sound, it doesn't mean that it's still not theologically true. Now, I, I like what one person said. This guy named Eugene Merrill. He says, it matters little from a theological standpoint whether Deuteronomy be assigned to Moses at an early date or not. For the history of Israel covered by Joshua through Kings was, in any case, a product of the late 6th century B.C., in its final canonical form. It does matter, however, that the historical narrative, though fundamentally theologically and interpretive in character, be regarded as an accurate account of events as they actually occur. That is, the books as sacred history are not thereby disqualified as records of Israel past in terms of standard definitions of historiographical literature. The theology of these books is developed in both overt statements of a, of a theological nature as well as in a more subtle account of events from which theology deduction can be drawn. In other words, the Bible is true. <laughs> Listen to this. Here's the theological emphasis of Joshua. The story of Rahab, it presents God's redemption plan of salvation. When the crossing of the Jordan River, it shows that God is able to direct his people and he's going to guide us even through challenging situations. The walls of Jericho, you know all the story means? It shares with us the truth that God brings victory to every battle we face. The sin of Achan, all it means is, hey, don't hide sin from God. He's omniscient. He knows everything about us, so don't keep it from him. And then when the sun stood still, check it out now. God sovereignly controls the universe. He can surely stop the sun on a, on a, on a, with a snap of his fingers. I say that respectfully. And he can do anything he wants to as he sovereignly sees fit. Right. Now, the emphasis of Judges is a little bit different. You see, the cycle of the book of Judges is this. There is a period of peace underneath the judge. Then the people turned away from God. God brought judges. Uh, God judges. Excuse me. God judges by delivering the people to their enemies. That is, people came in and devoured them and destroyed them and treated them horribly in a sense. Which by, sometimes God didn't necessarily mean it to happen that certain way, but God's judgment came upon them. And then the people turned back to God, and then God sent the judge to rescue the people. It's just a cycle continually. If you read Judges chapter one all the way to the end, that's exactly what happens over and over and over again. God's here it is. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That occurs multiple times in the book of Judges. God judges. Here's a theological truth for us. God judges unrepentant sin. Especially in the life of a believer. God forgives those who repent of their sins. Gideon's fleece. We have to trust God's divine and sovereign plan. Gideon's army. When God fights our battles, we are victors. Samson. God is our source of strength. Deborah. God will use anybody he wills. To accomplish his plan. 
It does not matter to faith because Joshua and Judges' historical accuracy does not negate the theological truths therein. Now I want to share with you one more truth. Last one, and this is my favorite one of them all. It does not matter to faith because the New Testament affirms the historical content of Joshua and Judges. Martin Luther, that great reformer of yesterday, Surely he wasn't an independent Baptist like us by any way, shape, or form. But I like what he said. He said, sola scriptura. In other words, scripture alone. We can look at history, and yes, it can support the Bible. We can look at archaeology, yes, it can support the Bible. We can look at all these things, and it can bring support to the Bible. But all is required is this book right here. All we need is the scriptures to affirm our faith. I don't need a historian, I don't need an archaeologist, I don't need a biologist, I don't need a chemist, I don't need a physicist, I don't need anybody else to tell me the Bible is right or wrong. All I need is to open up and read it for myself. History can strengthen our faith, but it alone is not required to have faith. Did you know, I, I want to try to test your brain if you will, but did you know there are ten Old Testament books that are never explicitly quoted in the New Testament? If you know one of them, shout it out. Obadiah. Obadiah, exactly right. Good job, Brother Andrews. Anybody else? Specifically quoted. It may be mentioned in the New Testament, but it's not specifically directly quoted. Esther. Esther, yeah. Good. No, that one is quoted. Yeah, good try. We talked about one of them this evening. The second one. Joshua. Judges. Judges, that's right. So hey, let me just share with them real fast. So jo Judges, Ruth, and Ezra. In our English Bible, Ezra and Nehemiah are separated. But in the Hebrew Bible, they are together in the scroll. So some scholars say that because Nehemiah is referenced in the New Testament, then Ezra can also be considered referenced. But in our English text, they are separated. So you've got Judges, Ruth, Ezra, Esther, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Lamentations, Obadiah, Jonah, and Zephaniah. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking in Hebrews chapter 11, many people in Judges are mentioned. You're thinking in the, in the genealogical record of Matthew that Ruth is mentioned. You're thinking that, that Solomon wrote Song of Solomon and, and Ecclesiastes, and he's, he's quoted. I know you're thinking that the New Testament does quote Jeremiah, so we're left. And then Jesus talked about Jonah. He said for his three days, and yeah, he said, I'll be in the heart of the earth just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the, in the belly's well, in the well of the belly, whatever. The belly's well. I mean, holy cow. Ooh, man. You have to quote, quote me on that one. Yeah. So Zephaniah, Obadiah, all these books are not specifically directly quoted in the New Testament. I thought that was very interesting. But here's some things to ponder. I like this quote. I really like this, actually. Just because you do not have a quote from Henry Ford in your 2017 Ford F-150 owner's manual does not mean your F-150 is not a Ford. Yeah, I like that. And I wrote down this. Just because there is not a specific quotation of the Old Testament and the New Testament does not mean it's not part of Scripture. So the 39 books in the Old Testament are inspired by God, even if they're not explicitly quoted in the New Testament. So Rahab the harlot is mentioned in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, and Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31. Joshua is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. In fact, out of Joshua and Judges, you would think that the New Testament specifically quoted them more, but the only time Joshua and Judges is even mentioned is Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, and it can also be uh, quoted back in Deuteronomy 2, and it says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 5. I thought it was interesting. I thought, as I was studying, there would be more. The walls of Jericho are mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30. The city of Jericho, by the way, is mentioned in the book of Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, both Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Jeremiah, and in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Hebrews. And the New Testament references to Judges is all of them are in the book of Hebrews. Gideon is mentioned. So you have the Hall of Faith. You have Enoch and, and, and Abel and and Noah, and Abraham, and Sarah, and uh, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, and, and all these characters, and Moses, and then you get down, and it mentions the walls of Jericho, and then it talks about Rahab the harlot, but then it gets to one point, and said, well, we don't even have time to mention of Gideon, and Bar Barak, and Samson, and Jephthah, so they're just mentioned, so, so here's my thought, that since the New Testament authors referred to them, it is a great like likable chance that it is considered scripture. Hey, if it was good enough for the writer of Hebrews and Jesus Christ, 
it's good enough for me, <laughs> as the old preacher said. So it does not matter to faith because the New Testament affirms the historical content of Joshua and Judges. Listen, if these were just stories in Joshua and Judges that, that were just meant to just tell little kids to have just only a theological truth, then why does the New Testament talk about it? As if they were historical events. Just because we don't have the, all the dots of the I's dotted and all the T's crossed in our historical analysis of history doesn't mean we have to throw out the book of Joshua and Judges. So let's recap of everything so far. It does not matter to faith because we have not discovered everything about the historical context of Joshua and Judges. We have so much more to discover. When I went to Israel, there I, I, I listened to a Messianic Jew talk about these areas. That is a Christian Jewish person sharing God's word and sharing the history. And I also listened to secular Jewish people who were not Christians share about these events. And I was in the city of David, and I remember this lady was telling stories, and she talked about how she was living in one of the greatest and most exciting times of the world today because of how all the events that were coming around in Israel and all the discoveries that they were making. And listen, you can go back 20 years ago in Israel, and they've discovered so many more things about the past since then. And so we have to logically assume that we're going to discover more. The more we dig, the more we're going to discover about history. It doesn't matter to faith because believing Joshua and Judges requires a childlike faith. Do you have the childlike faith? Well, I hope you do. And I hope I do as well. It does not matter to faith because history can neither prove nor disprove the events of Joshua and Judges. It does not matter to faith because Joshua and Judges' historical accuracy does not negate the theological truths therein. And lastly, we look, it does not matter to faith because the New Testament affirms the historical content of Joshua and Judges. Remember, faith that is not tested cannot be trusted. Our faith, the Bible, has been tested by skepticism, has been tried by atheism. But I'm here to tell you something. It remains trusted and true because it's the Word of God. So I ask you a question that I asked you in the beginning. Does the historical accuracy of Joshua and Judges matter to your faith? Well, I share with you reasons why I think it does not necessarily. And I hope that you'll take this and ponder it a little bit more detail and realize that the only thing we need about our faith is this book right here. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much.